and welcome to another episode of our CGI Experience Podcasts. We're taking a short break from our foundation series to address a topical subject all over the news, which in broad strokes is surrounding GPT-3 and chat GPT. Today, I am joined by my talented colleagues, Chidi Akarinwa and Kate Taylor, who will provide nuance from a design and development perspective. Let's uh, take a second to reintroduce ourselves quickly. Uh, Kate, would you like to go first? Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm a conversational AI developer. I've been a full stack developer for many years um, and have built out onto my machine learning side of things as well to, to combine myself into a conversational AI developer. Great, Chidi? Yep, uh, so Chidi Karuna, as you mentioned, and I'm more on the design side but I do have a background in NLP, NLP data science, so uh, really looking forward to the uh, conversation today. And finally, I'm Cheryl Olibrand, a lead digital consultant specializing in conversational AI, and I'm going to try to guide us a little bit through this talk today. So let's address the topic we've been asked to react to nearly daily. Now, this is vaguely around GPT-3 or chat GPT, and we will help define these terms in a moment. I do want to preface this by saying we are not attempting to inflate expectations, uh, rather brings some clarity around where we see opportunities and limitations within the discipline of conversational AI. But before we can address it, we need to clarify what opportunity we're addressing. So I'm going to uh, start this out by sort of asking, why all the hype and what's the difference between ChatGPT and GPT 3.5? Chidi, can you want to help us with that start? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's a good question. And I think to be honest, what makes it really impressive is, you know, the GPT model itself and in and, and this this very current generation that's um, out there now is is a very large language model, which if you are familiar with um, our industry is not a not a, uh, an uncommon term or terminology. Uh, LLMs have been, a while, have been around for a while, but what makes this uh, quite impressive is it has about 175 billion parameters. Um, compared to the previous generation GPT-2 that had 1.5 billion. So you'll really, uh, the model itself has a lot more to work with to, to, be, to be able to really interpret and analyze natural language in an unprecedented way. Um, and it's been trained over a very large uh, data set as well. I think it's probably the biggest neural network as of 2021 as well. So, I mean, those are the sort of numbers and, and the sort of stats that you, you that makes it you know, quite impressive, actually. All right. So billions and billions already. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it projected to go to a trillion or something soon? Yes. Yes. The new, um, I think that will be the next generation GPT-4 is going to go up to a trillion um, and a bit parameters. So the um, some of the things that you could achieve with that will be were really interesting to find out when that when that time comes. But as you said, there are, you know, nuances to these, um, to these models, which I'm sure we'll get into it. Uh, yeah, today. yeah. Hype, uh, the, the, the numbers, like the size is one thing, but I think the hype that we're hearing around this is different, right? It's a, it's a little bit, I feel, driven by uh, investment um, decisions that are being made or have recently been made, right? Like um, Microsoft, which was an early investor in uh, OpenAI, which uh, is behind uh, GPT, whatever version, so all the versions, um, they've just decided to make another really large investment. And then, of course, um, you know, OpenAI is the makers of ChatGPT. And uh, I guess Elon Musk is one of the big people between behind OpenAI. <laughs> so... And I mean, there's just, there's just a scramble, right? I don't know if it's purely because of the big names or the big numbers or um, everyone trying to be associated with these names, right? Because it seems like every platform and tool we work with is scrambling to tell us that they either have or will integrate with ChatGPT in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think this is probably a good point to kind of talk about the difference between mm. those, those two because... Um, you know, Chat GPT itself is really a product that was is built on top of the GPT uh, model, specifically GPT three point five. 
So there is that that's a, a difference that people should be should be aware of. So chat GPT specifically for chat, but the model itself, GPT, can be used for other to solve other, you know, language related um problems or you know, develop other language related solutions as well. Okay, you had worked with another tool before, didn't you too? Or had played with at least another one that was similar to ChatGPT, but not of the same name? Yes, I was looking at Instruct GPT, which is um, human created. Um, I guess um, after the the difficulties that Microsoft suffered a number of years ago with the um, bot being hijacked and uh, learning some, some nasty stuff, um, I was uh, intrigued to see what could be done about curating that. Um, I also had a go at asking ChatGPT whether I could use it in conversational AI, and it was kind enough to give me a, a really good answer. Um, in terms of being able to um, generate response to user input uh, and, and also um, to be able to work with conversation history. So uh, if you ask it to generate a conversation around uh, resetting a password, it can do that for you, as well as giving you different ways of saying things like, I don't know, and which I find really useful as a developer when you're trying to find ways of cross-checking the, uh, the, the NLU model you've been training up for that particular conversation. I would say also it did provide caveats. It did say to me straight away that um, obviously it's trained on general purpose text um, and it may not necessarily be the model. Um, and also that it's uh, it's quite a big system. So trying to use it actually in real time in a conversational agent is not really how to do it. But as a back-end tool, uh, it recommends itself. <laughs> it does. Well, it sounds like it was fairly forthcoming then. Yes. Yeah, I was... Um, I was intrigued. Um, and I think certainly I was impressed by the way that it generates a conversation that does sound realistic. So obviously a lot of work has gone into the training there. <laughs> Great. So we know that it says that it's useful in conversational AI, but from what we've been able to investigate, would we call it useful or useless or somewhere in between? Chidi, how about, what do you think? Yeah, I know that again, that's a, um, a good, good, good point of discussion. I mean, I think one of the areas that I've I've been sort of looking into and have kind of come across and, and we've seen this is is really the sort of behind the scenes stuff, right? So not necessarily the customer facing side of things, but take for example the conversational AI design process itself. We know that one of the things that we can be quite um, I don't want to use the word manual, but you know it's is 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 generating that copy generating those example utterances and, and really making them, um, you know, in, you know, getting them to be, to be just right. Um, and GPT can, can kind of, you know, take, take the place um, uh, of that and, and help supercharge the design process you know, by being able to generate example utterances and copy and, you know, things of that nature. And we're seeing this with um, actually one of the, uh, the, the well-known um, conversation design tools um, uh, has actually been able to integrate Chat GPT um, into the into the tool. So, to do things you know like generate response variations and utterances, entities, synonyms, and no match responses. You know the, the standard stuff that can can actually take a lot of time in the design process, and you yeah. can scale this up pretty quickly. Okay, you know. good. It can do, it can do, there was another thing they announced too, didn't they, that they were? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yes. Um, I mean, I saw that um, that they're able to kind of uncover conversation edge cases by, you know, being able to give the, the assistant the ability to take over and help push the user back um, to, to, to original intent when the user is off a happy path. Um, obviously, that is more on a sort of customer face inside. So one does need to be a little bit cautious in how you how you deploy that, and um, you know. But again, I think the the, the key thing is it, it it can be useful to to your point, um, particularly in supercharging that sort of design process, which we know can can you know can make a huge difference in these type of projects. Right. So, Kate, what's your take on this? Well, I've been lucky enough today to have a play with um, an integration with one of our conversational AI platforms who have um, built um, an integration straight into OpenAI. And I've been using that to point it at a part of a web page. So say it's part of a customer's system that you want to bring frequently asked questions from. 
and then lets the uh, chat GPT handle conversation around frequently asked questions. Um, obviously, this is, is extremely new stuff. It wasn't around last week, and it's brilliant to see how that kind of usage is um, finding its way into the products that we use. Wow, that's yeah, that is that is a good one. Were we were we talking before as well around um, this was I think it was partially covered and what uh, Chidi was talking about maybe with the um, trying to prompt a user back on path, but even before that in the back end, um, how about a use around disambiguation? Yes, yeah, so that is interesting. Um, certainly, if we're trying to cover things like medical terms or um, even general industry terms, it's quite frequently uh, if a customer provides an acronym, we do need to disambiguate that. And that's another thing that ChatGPT can help with uh, in that it, it's uh, obviously been trained on a wide area. Um, having said that, obviously, some companies and some customers will have extremely specialized acronyms that ChatGPT3 won't know about. And I guess its, it's view of the world is only up until, um, I think it's November 2021. So, um, I think there's always a point where we would need to make sure that we're training for the domain that the customer is looking for. And in the end, it is our responsibility to make sure that our um, NLU models are, are trained for our customers. So I, I think I see it as a tool, probably, rather than someone to replace me. <laughs> we could never, never replace you. You're so much broader than any of this. But talking, I guess, actually about broad, I, you know, with a large language model just in general, right, that means that it's going to be really broad and sh shallow. So it's trying to capture everything, but at the same time, it can't go deep. Whenever we're um, working with a customer, quite often, we need to go narrow and deep, right? We need to make sure that we're reaching uh, or understanding people on that topic or in that category of things that they want to be discussing at the moment. Um, and then to be able to, to, to really drill down on it, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, it's obvious that um, sometimes um, callers um, on the CAI systems uh, are modeled by using acronyms and obviously that's something our designers make sure we don't do and uh, but yes I think it's important that where we need to go deep we do um, and and take our customers terminology and, and the, the existing uh, resources they have on their websites or help pages or frequently asked questions to get the the tone and the style right and for that perhaps chat GPT as you say is perhaps not always the right thing or at least it's a starting point we can build on. Right. I know um, just a second ago you had, you had mentioned FAQ and uh, I was thinking about this in terms of before because, you know, we know that it's trained on this really broad, <laughs> broad base. I was thinking about it in terms of um, I don't want to call it search and summarization, but, you know, quite often we have things built into the back end, let's say, to help agents where we are trying to find information and summarize it so that they can more quickly help a customer. So, you know, an agent assist type capabilities. Now, when it comes to the external <laughs> sort of search and summary, though, I I, I feel like that, that GPT-3 could fit in there. I'm just, or whatever, you know, iteration we want to talk about, what we're building into the solution. Uh, but I am, I am a little bit scared. Like you said, you want to keep a human in the loop <laughs> because I... Uh, you, you, we'd have to figure out where either it's it's low enough value that we're just getting them to the sort of right area where we can uh, steer them into our flows where we're very confident about the results um, or, you know, using it with a disambiguation to make sure that we're understanding them. But I don't know. I guess that I feel, think, and this is going back to the hype a bit more too, right? Like the G in GPT means generative. It's a gen it's the third generation generative pre-trained transformer if you you know break down what gpt3 stands for but i from what we've played with and and this might sound a little bit controversial but i think that it's more of an illusion than it's generative when it would be safer to call it predictive right because the way these things work they're 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 getting the content from somewhere Right. Um, and it, it's sort of like, you know, when you do a Google search, you get you, you can get these snippets that directly answer your question um, in a really specific way. But then you get the link that takes you to further content. Right. So it puts it in context. And my concern is that we don't know where 
all of the little snippets that it's picking up and sticking together come from? Do you see some risk around that? Yes, I guess there is. Um, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's um, the idea of using a search engine across a customer site to try and pull out what their view of the world is and what their customer system model and is and their terminology is, has been around probably for at least 10 years. Uh, and pointing chat GPT just at your customer's website and saying, don't look anywhere else, just look there. And that's what your world is and, and generate me some text and the conversation around there. I would say is relatively safe. But on the other hand, um, again, it, it is worth having a human in the loop to, to create it. I think uh, with all those things, I think it's, uh, it's providing with a first draft that you could then modify. Yeah, I think that the power with with this is is more around the architecture that this this model is providing, and being able to use that to solve, you know, other types of language problems which can support these conversational AI use cases as well. And so, um, if you're listening, we're not necessarily trying to bash <laughs> um, GPT, but what we're trying to say, and I think you you guys have said it really well, is that it's more uh, um, it's another tool that we can use to kind of support some of the stuff that we're, you know, we're already um, we're doing. And I think what will be interesting is, um, to, to the point you mentioned earlier, Kate, is seeing all these different platform providers actually integrating it now into the platform and seeing how that actually um, affects um, you know, NLU uh, design and NLU development um, and how that can play a role in um, you know, potentially um, uh, solving some of those um you know, conversational AI uh, use cases. Good point. Um, I don't think we did mention it earlier, but uh, I want a, a bit of the difference between ChatGPT and GPT-3 is that uh, they've tried to sort of clean up <laughs> the underlying data with, with ChatGPT in a way, right, to avoid it becoming really um, offensive and abusive, things that we know can happen when um, when <laughs> machine learning is used on really offensive type content, right? Um, I think that we have planned, I, we don't have a date set for it yet, but we have planned a discussion on um, trying to keep bias out or account for bias when you're designing. And I think that we will need to revisit chat GPT and GPT-3 yeah, as part of absolutely. that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I know we can't talk about absolutely everything, um, but... Um, didn't we run into an issue? I think Kate, you you were uh, you were playing with ChatGPT for writing code snippets, and you got different responses. Um, no, if you ask it the same question um, um, over over and over again, you do get um, different responses. But generally, the responses are getting shorter, so I think it just decides to summarize for you and to try and write it in a different way, to hope that you're not continually asking it the same question because you're not really understanding it. Um, I think one thing I did notice was when I asked it to write a regular expression, um, I, it wrote out a regular expression and gave me some help text. And I recognized that help test um, text from a, um, a regular expression checker that I use quite frequently. Uh, and I mean, obviously it's getting its code snippets from somewhere um, and the style of the snippets as to how to do it. And I think many developers certainly have their favorite sites where they go with, um, where fellow developers, you know, um, will post solutions to queries and you know, differences in versions and things. Uh, when I did ask it to make a code snippet and to specifically include error handling in it, I was impressed that it did it and did a good job of it. Um, if you just ask for code, you just get code, you don't get error handling. So um, I was also amused, actually, um, that when ChatGPT was having a bit of an off day or was very busy and couldn't let us on, um, it alternated between writing a rap about the status of GPT um, <laughs> or um, a guided meditation about the status of GPT, which is much better than just 404, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> much more entertaining. Are you ready to uh, regale us with the rap? Uh, no. I think okay. I might leave that to Chiddy. Um. <laughs> I, I don't think, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll save it for another another time, and who knows, it might write a new rap for us next time. All right, so maybe maybe we should go ahead and try to summarize because we we covered a lot of ground today. Um, 
it seems like this could impact different industries. We have really tried to keep it centered around conversational AI, which is, you know, our, our wheelhouse right now. Um, there could be potential, I guess, for I'm thinking sort of content um, heavy industries, right, where you're constantly generating content. I've been seeing, you know, use cases around marketing and things like that. But again, I feel like it's got to be really low value in case they're, you know, due to risk or you've got to keep uh, human in a loop or for these entertainment purposes, like uh, like getting a rap written to you for you about conversational AI. Um, how about uh, Chidi, any further thoughts on summar summarizing? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I mean, it d depends on the different types of industries or verticals that and how they want to, you know, implement this type of technology. But I, I think one thing that's important to bear in mind is that, you know, this these models don't actually understand the data it's, it, they're processing. Um, they're really good at seeking patterns and finding different patterns so that they can use that to, you know, make recommendations and predictions, etc. But they don't actually understand the data that they're processing. So I think when you think about GPT, chat GPT, whatever lens you're looking at this, you know, I, I think ultimately it's best, you know, served in or used in the hands of a skilled professional. Somebody who actually understands that uh, domain very, very well. Um, we talked about it from a design perspective and Kate talked about it from a, a development perspective as well. I, mean, I would imagine as a as a developer, you um, if you if you really know what you're doing, then it, it could serve as, a, as something that helps uh, your process, and, uh, particularly from a design perspective as well. So ultimately, it's it's I think it's best used in the hands of people who actually understand the data that it doesn't understand when it's you know processing that data. Um, so that's kind of how I'll, uh, I'll sum it all up. All right. Kate, any further thoughts before we close? Yeah, I think I'm certainly excited to use the um, the integrations of the CI development platforms we're using um, are bringing out. And, and that I think in, in the world of frequently asked questions is going to be a big help. Um, I think the uh, the ways of saying things and the, uh, the cross-checking that allows me to do as we try and get quality built in uh, right the way through the product will be useful. And I think um, there'll be days when the co-generation will also be a big help for me too. Wonderful. So we'll see if we can find any really sticky use cases and how long it stays free so that the business case for that still supports it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Actually, on that point, I think they're bringing out a commercial version uh, quite soon. Um, but I think we'll still have a free one. But anyways. Yeah, they've, they've only promised it to be free during uh, OpenAI's feedback period. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're going to make their investment <laughs> back somehow. Yeah. All right. So we will continue to watch this space, but hope that this episode has helped to alleviate any FOMO and uh, put this question to rest for the time being. Please do join us again. We look forward to speaking with you in the near future. Mm -hmm.